If you would turn with me to the book of Matthew in chapter 9, we are going to continue in as we read that Jesus is now demonstrating, as we said, the authority uh, that he has and has been given. We heard, as we said all along, that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount spoke with authority. And now he is demonstrating that authority in different areas of life and showing the people that he came to that he has all authority. See, it is no wonder when we get to the end of Matthew after he is resurrected from the dead that he makes this statement because he's been demonstrating it all along. See, Matthew, in his narrative, as he was writing all along, he was letting us see and letting us hear and letting us understand and recognize the authority of Jesus. And at the end of Matthew, what does Jesus say? Now all authority has been given unto me. And so after it is finished, after he is resurrected, but up until that point, he is demonstrating what his authority is. And then after he has completed his mission, after he now has died for the sins of man and is resurrected, he comes back and says, now the plan is finished. But we know that that wasn't an end. It was really just a beginning for us who would trust him. But in order to have a good beginning, you need to know by what authority you begin. And Jesus said, you begin in me, and I have all authority. And so if I, if I can have you stand in, in the centerfold of your bulletin, I believe we have. And I'm just going to ask this real quick because I'm, I'm not sure where we stop in this because we're not going to get the whole text. Brother, can I have one of those bulletins, please? Thank you. I don't want to sound off here. Uh, you keep that. He's got it for me. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. If we can go ahead and turn to the center, we have down to verse 8, although the text for today is greater than that. But I want us to read just this first part. And let's read together, starting at verse 1 in chapter 9. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to man. Father, as we get into your word, may our focus be sharp. May you enlighten our hearts and our minds that we would hear what you were saying, see where you were directing and respond in the right way. We ask you this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now we see here as we ended last week that Jesus, after he, after he crossed over and, and, and taught the disciples a lesson about trusting him when he said we're going on a destination, we're, instead of taking a road trip, we're going to take a sea trip, but we're going to go to the other side because he said get to the other side. So they get there. So in the process, they learn a lesson. When Jesus says we're going somewhere, he plans to get there. And so then when they, when they, when they learn that lesson, they get to this place. And of course, we saw that Jesus has authority even over the spirit world. We saw that whenever he confronted the men with the demons, um, but we also saw Jesus' priorities. Because even though he, he, he cast the demons, legion, they were many, out of these men, he said, but what it came with is a, is, a, is a great financial cost for the people in the town. They lost their pigs, but then we saw the priorities of Jesus. Jesus' priorities is for people above possessions. Because even in his deliverance, if he chooses to deliver while exacting a cost on you, he'll do it. That's what we saw, because his priority is people, and what he was telling us is our priority must be people. 
He didn't just do it just to kind of have some sort of show. He was giving a model for us to follow. And so not that he says you shouldn't care about your possessions, but he was saying that your possessions don't have the proper place when you put them above people. And so now he shares that, and now we have an example to go by. But instead, they had preferred pigs over people. They preferred the swine over healing. That's not saying that you shouldn't have or eat pig. Please don't say that. But he's saying that you shouldn't have your priorities out of order. And he made it clear, but they wanted Jesus to leave. After he did what God does, they didn't want God doing any more there. So they asked him to leave. And Jesus, like you would, you don't want me? Great. He got back in the boat that he crossed on and left. That is a sad thing. When you have an opportunity to be blessed by Jesus, when you had him there in person, but you preferred your financial gain to Jesus Christ. You know, messed up my job, Lord. I, I'm, I'm, I'm done with you. Um, as if God can't provide another. Um, you, 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 done, you done messed up my network. You done, you done messed everything up over here. My friends done left me, and, and, and all that I had went bye-bye, so why don't you go too? And Jesus left. I, I did, he got back in the boat and went over to where his home base was in Capernaum. And it's interesting that 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 he left that region because they didn't want him. Folk, don't get hung up in people that don't want Jesus. We get hung up over the people that don't want to hear about him, don't want to serve him, don't want to walk with him, and we forget about those that do. Just understand, we've heard when we were going through the Sermon on the Mount that there would be many that would not trust him. And that would be few that would. And when they say many and few, in relation to the greater population, there will be more that will walk away from him than there will be that will walk toward him. And we need to prepare our hearts and our minds for that. And it's okay. God says, be glad that you were the ones that received him. And so we get now to chapter 9, and he gets in the boat. And understand, Matthew, I'm going to look at Mark on this, because Matthew does not spend a whole lot of time talking about the situation around the paralytic. Why did he do that? Because Matthew's focus, once again, is a little different. Matthew's focus is on showing the faith of the people in response to the authority of Jesus. We want some more details. We go to some of the other Gospels where their focus is different. And so Mark is, 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 is wanting you to see how people deal with how Jesus serves people and how they respond. And so in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, if you can turn there, put your finger in Matthew, turn over to Mark chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 1 through 12. And in there, you get a bit more detail. As we look at that, here's what we see. We see that Jesus came back in, and he was not trying to attract or draw a crowd. Understand this for a second. Mark uses that term, the crowd, a lot, and it means, I mean, and there are some different meaning and things to it. But here in Mark, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. In other words, Jesus tried to come in unnoticed. What happened now is his popularity had now risen high. He went over to this place. I mean, now remember, he's doing things that only God can do. And so that demonstration will attract the crowd. You do that today and you will have all the news channels trying to find out what's going on. You start healing folk. I'm not talking about some of these gimmicks and stuff that people do at these so-called healing meetings. I'm talking about people are touched and instantly they are healed and lives are changed and they are transformed. And you start having that happen and people will come around from all over, not necessarily because they want to hear about Jesus. They want to see what's going on. You will attract a crowd easily. But when Mark talks about the crowd, 
have to understand in his message what he's trying to get us to understand. I want to read some things about the crowd in a moment, but he says, verse 2, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. As a matter of fact, in Matthew, he focuses on that. Jesus' ministry is centered around preaching and proclaiming the word of God. Let me help us out. Once again, Jesus is a model for us today. And so if our ministries are marked by something greater than preaching God's word, we have an issue. If Jesus' ministry was centered on preaching what was then the word, why would our ministry be centered on anything other than that? And here's a good test for you with ministries. Where does the word of God being taught, um, where is that placed? Is it placed as something that kind of happens during the service? That we sing our life and our hearts out and then we spend about five minutes in the word of God. Jesus taught the people when he gathered. But he taught on different levels depending on whom he was with. Boy, that's kind of interesting. We see with the crowd he spoke in parables. We see with the crowd that he did speak and sometimes he rebuked. Um, them, but when he spoke with the crowd, because there are various kinds of people out there, but his intentional, his direct, his clearly um, um, explained teaching was reserved for those that were smaller in number and were those disciples who were actually following him. Amen. See, when we see the crowd, the crowd in Scripture and especially in Mark, the crowd could be fickle. They were up one day, they were down the next. They would say, Hosanna in the highest. And then later on in the week, they would say, crucify him. Yeah, yeah. See, it was the crowd that would be on your side one day and be against you the other. That's nothing new. That's still the same way today. Get a large crowd around you constantly, and boy, they'll turn on you in a hot second, depending on what you've done or haven't done. Fan bases are like that. Come on, you know we've got true fans, and you got the bandwagon ones. You got those that when you are riding high, they're riding high with you, buying the T-shirts and, and the caps, and they're shouting your name. And then the moment you string about two or three losses together, they're wearing bags over their head. They don't want to know you. That's the crowd. Jesus never used the crowd as a litmus test for his success. But somehow today, we do. Somehow today, the success of a church is how big of a crowd you can draw. Now, now uh, I'm not being an advocate for just trying to thin things out, but understand the crowd did not hold the weight then in the eyes of Jesus that it does in the eyes of his church today. And so we honor and applaud those who can draw a crowd. Not really talking about the makeup of that crowd. And we also see here, though, that the crowd many times can be the opposition. When we look in Mark, Mark refers to the crowd as opposing Jesus. He refers to the crowd as pushing against him. Or in the case in Mark chapter 2, the crowd is in the way. You say, how do you get that? Well, when you look here and you see the crowd in Mark chapter 2, verse 3, it says, And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd... They removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And if you go back to Matthew, again, the crowd was in this time in the way. And, and, and here, and they wouldn't move. See, it's not saying that they couldn't move. They wouldn't move. Dude, like we were here first. Nah, man, get in line, get in line. No, 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 no. We come to see Jesus. What do you come to see? We come to see what he's going to do next. 
We can see what's going to happen, man. Something's happening around. This dude is happening, boy. It is, I mean, he is fire. Every time he, he's, he shows up, something big happens. We're here to see. And boy, they would not move. Here comes a guy. Now, now they know that Jesus can heal. Here's my deal. They know he can heal. And you got four guys carrying their friend um, who is paralyzed, obviously, on a mat. And he wants to get in, and y'all won't move. See, you know he needs Jesus, but you're not letting him through. I came to see something. I'm not getting out the way. But he needs Jesus. So? See, please be careful that you are not a part of the crowd or you're a part of that group that are there but are in the way. Instead of helping people to get in to see Jesus, you are preventing people from being close to Jesus. And so as that point first, when we, mean, when we look at this, it is the obstacle of the crowd and the determination of faith. I want to see the obstacle of the crowd and the determination of faith. Matthew doesn't focus on it as so much, but he does say that, that in instance, what we are seeing is what true faith does and how Jesus responds to true faith because of his authority. We see here that they get up there, his four friends, and I want friends like this. I want friends that be like, well, man, we tried. They ain't letting us in. I don't know what to tell you. Let's go home. They realize that Jesus would change this man's life, and they are interceding for him. They are standing in for him. They are not taking no for an answer. Now, you have to understand something about this. The obstacle was, how do I get around this crowd? How do I get around this group, this, 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 this group that is preventing me from getting my friend to Jesus? How do I do that? And so they realized they can't go through just ordinary means. We got to go around. Now, you have to understand something about roofs back in, 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 in Palestine at that time. Understand this. Usually, like, they were flat because that's a place where you usually sat to get out of the house. I know today our houses are well lit, air conditioned. Whenever we want to get away from the, the heat and everything else, we go inside. But it was the reverse. They didn't have AC. I hope y'all know that, right? They didn't have AC. Um, um, didn't have electricity, you know, but didn't have AC. Um, didn't have those cool breezes. These houses were, were dark many times, and you would have some light that would come in, but these houses were dark. So the roof served places where you would go to sometimes even eat, places where you would go to rest and relax. You see in Acts chapter 10, it was where Peter was when he had his dream from the Lord, when he was on the roof. And so don't think of the roof as yours, which is like this, because you can't sit up there and pray. You pray that the Lord don't have you fall, but you can't sit up there and pray. These were flat roofs, and there's usually a staircase outside on the side of the house that led to it. And so they looked around and said, the crowd is crazy here. And they go, but our friend needs Jesus. Oh, for people that would stand up for their friends and not let any obstacle get in the way because they have that kind of faith and trust in what Jesus can do for them. And somebody in the crowd goes, what about the roof? I'm just trying to picture this. And they're like, man, have you lost your mind? The roof? What are we going to do when we get up there? I don't know. Dig through it. Now, you have to understand the way the roofs were constructed. They weren't these nice roofs like you have right now. And these were roofs that, yes, they had wood beams that would be attached to me that would go to either side of the house with some other pieces in between. And it would be thatch covered by mud on top. And so you could dig through it. And there were spaces in between that you could rip up and tear up. And can you imagine that? This house wasn't theirs. You have to understand that. I want you to see the, the determination of faith here. There was an obstacle. We couldn't get in. No one is letting us in. 
okay, let's go through the roof, but what are we going to do when we get there? Well, I, I, hey, let's just tear a hole in it and drop them down. And I can imagine if I'm in this group, I'm going, dude, this is the craziest idea we've ever had. Oh, my goodness. What do we, like, really? What's the owner going to say? I don't care. We need to get him to Jesus. And so I know when we see the scene of Jesus standing there in the house teaching, okay, right now, if we start having babies cry or, or loud noises or something, sometimes we may get distracted. It doesn't bother me anymore because I used to have a train at the church that I was last. We used to have a train that would come through. Brandon, you remember that train that would come through almost at the same time every Sunday. And, and, and depending on when it was preaching, and it would it would blow its horn, that loud train horn. Sometimes it was a great exclamation point because I would say something and then <laughs> you would hear it come through. Sometimes it was right in the middle of a sentence. Finally, I got used to it enough that if it, if it was coming through and I couldn't continue, I'd just stop and then I'd go on. But that was a quick distraction. Can you imagine the distraction? You're sitting there and pieces of roof is falling <laughs> Okay, come on, let's get real, because I know we like to sanitize these accounts. They're sitting there, and mud is being ripped up, much less the noise that's there, and they are ripping this roof up. I'm wondering what the owner is saying. What are they doing? Do, do go outside and get these nuts. And they're ripping and ripping, and, and then when they get through, they go, there he is. Yo, right by Jesus. Drop him down. Drop him down right here. And they let him down. And can you imagine now all eyes are on these four guys letting this paralytic down through the roof into their house. Everyone got quiet. I'm sh I, I, I don't know. Did Jesus stop teaching or did he continue? But they came down and there he sat. And see, you know what? For you and I, here's what would have been the narrative. And he was annoyed greatly by their interruption. <laughs> or, and the owner went berserk and threw them all out. Because these guys did not care what they needed to do because they had true faith. In Mark, this is the first time faith is mentioned and Faith is seen. See, we think faith is what I know. I have faith, and we talk about something in our head. We see here faith is first spoken of as in demonstration. If you really believe in Jesus, your actions will show it. See, what you really believe, you do. What I really believe, you see it in how I live. What I, what, 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 what I, what I really believe, you see it in how I spend my money. You, 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 you see it in the ways I entertain myself. You see it in the way I live, in the way I treat my family members. My faith is on demonstration by my actions. That's why James could clearly say, faith without Works is a dead faith. It's not faith at all. Why? Because if you believe something truly, you will demonstrate it rightly in your actions. And so he comes up and he says, the next thing we see is, and Jesus saw their faith. See, it didn't say he was, he was upset, like, what are you guys doing? You know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to preach here. No, he saw their faith. How did he say? He saw their actions, which demonstrated that they trusted him and that they believed that he could do something for this young man. And so as he was let down, it says Jesus saw their faith. He was impressed. He, was, he, he loved the fact that these guys loved their friend so much that they had to get him before Jesus. And understand it was the crowd that was inside the house that was getting the teaching. And so truth faith always finds a way to press forward to get to Jesus. True faith 
always finds a way to press forward to get to Jesus. And notice his, and notice his response. Now, Jesus is notice of and his response to true faith in him. Jesus is notice of and his response to true faith in him. True faith is noticed by Jesus. Understand that. It is. When you have true action demonstrating faith, it gets the notice of God. And then as they lay him down, he turns to the one in whom his friends brought. He said nothing to the friends. And he looks at the man and says, son. And that son is both a term of endearment, but is also a term of authority, meaning one who has authority to one who does not. And he says, son. Matthew says, he says, take heart, son. Don't be discouraged. He says, your sins are forgiven. Hold on a second. I didn't come here for my sins to be forgiven. They did all this work so I can get up off this mat, man. You tell me my sins are forgiven. What does that do me? <laughs> ah, but he was going somewhere that they didn't understand. See, his friends too. His friends understood they needed to get to Jesus so he can get better. As a, he can get better. Jesus went deeper than getting better. Jesus said, the issue, yes, you are sick. But sickness in and of itself is a result of the original sin of man. The reason we get sick and we die is because of sin that is in everyone. You mean what? Because of a particular sin? Sometimes. But, some, but, but overall, sin creates sickness. But not just physical sickness, it was spiritual sickness, which is even greater. And so he says now, he turns to him and says, your sins are forgiven. He went to the base and to the root of what the problem was. And see, for Jesus, he never just deals with symptoms. Jesus, I want you to make me feel better. Uh, uh, Jesus, I need more money in my account. And what does Jesus do? He goes to the problems. He says, look, your sin is getting you where you are. I know you're having some issues right here. He says, but the problem is your sin. And he deals with the root of the problem first. Then he can deal with all the other things. And so he says, your sins are forgiven. I love this next scene because his response to it, but you have to see also Jesus is on full display demonstrating who he is because in the crowd, in their mind, in their heads, the Pharisees who, this is interesting, the, and here was this man <clears throat> physically paralyzed and was brought to Jesus because they realized his need but the group that didn't realize their spiritual paralysis was the Pharisees who thought something bad was going on when God was bringing deliverance. These were the guys that should have known better but knew nothing. And so in their hearts, because now, you know, after all they've seen, they didn't want to voice their thoughts. And so they were like, this man is blaspheming. Because in their mind they go, who can forgive sin but God? Jesus is like, <coughs> that's what I'm showing you. Who can forgive sin but God alone? No one pronounced forgiveness of sins. And on that day of atonement, forgiveness was granted because they followed what God had put down for the forgiveness of sins. But people didn't do it. And so he says, your sins are forgiven. And they said in their mind, who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus turns and says in their direction, I can imagine this. And so <clears throat> I'm just going to say that the crowd over here said that. I'm not saying that y'all are evil. I'm just going to use you <laughs> as an example because this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, I'll do this whole section over here. How about that? <clears throat> and so <clears throat> he turns to them in the house and goes, why do you think evil thoughts in your heart? Now, I'm wondering what they thought, like, I didn't say anything. How do you know what I'm thinking? Well, you, you just asked something about, about only God can do these things. And then he turns to you and he does what only God can do first, and that is to read your mind. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm loving this. 
This is one of those Jesus is savage scenes. He turns and he goes, I hear you thinking. He says, so which is easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up, take up your bed, and after you have risen, actually the way the Greek is constructed, after you have arisen, go home. After he says, rise, and Matthew, after you have arisen, rise, because this was a past event now brought into the current, rise, take up what you were laying on that was, that was it wasn't paralyzing you, but because you were paralyzed is what you were lay, lying on, take it up and go home. He says, which is easier? But then he really does the mic drop. I would, I would, I would drop it, but it's going to cost us money. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but then he says, because once again, what he is demonstrating is Jesus is, a dem- Jesus is demonstrating his authority to forgive sins and to heal, or to heal and to forgive sins. And so I could, I could, I could title this, Jesus has the authority to forgive sins and to heal. But he says to them, so that you would know, and that no wasn't just head, he says, so that you would experience the fact that the Son of Man, that's how he referred, that's how he referred to himself in the flesh, that the Son of Man has the authority. Once again, that's what you know the theme is, to forgive sins on earth, just in case you need specificity. He says, right here on earth so that you would know and experience that, that, that I have the authority to forgive sins because he's talking to them. He says he turns to the paralytic. I love this and says, rise, take up your bed and go home. I, I'm, 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 I'm like, I can't even imagine it. This was an in-your-face moment, but he was telling them, I have authority. You don't do that unless you know he's going to get up. You just put it front and center. He has to get up or you are seen as a fraud right then and there. And so he says to him, look, this whole issue is of forgiving sins. And so he says, which one is easier? I could have told him, take up his bed and walk, but I wanted you to know that I have the authority to forgive sins. Hey, get up and go home. And the guy gets up and goes home. I'm, I'm, I'm really just trying to picture this because he, he picks up his mat and he just walks out. <laughs> It says he walked, and, and, uh, and I imagine, see, now the crowd who wouldn't let him in has to let him out. Because they're all standing there looking at this guy like, what? And he gets up and just strolls on out. He followed Jesus' orders. And it says they were afraid, as all of us would be. What the? You would be like, what did I just see? And it says, and they were afraid. And when they were afraid, but then they glorified God, right action. They were afraid because this was not human, and then they realized this was of God. And so Jesus really says to the Pharisees, did I answer your question? And so he leaves, case over, case closed. And I love this. Here is what he does. He says to them, he says to them, I have the authority to forgive sin. I have the authority to heal. But he says, but it's, but here he says, I want you guys to notice what I see. He said, I see sickness as a result of sin. Sometimes it's directly. And in this particular case, as you look at the context and the tone of the text, Jesus knew if he can read minds, he knew his past. And he wasn't just speaking in generalities. It is believed by theologians that there was something in this man's life that led to his paralysis. And so Jesus dealt with the sin because sometimes our sins have direct result on our health. But sometimes sickness is just a result that we are sinful human beings. 
and we get sick and we die. Because that's the result of the fall. And Jesus says he has the compassion. When he said to that man, take heart, my son. Don't be discouraged. I can fix this. But I have to deal with your sin first. And for some of us today, we're looking for Jesus to do something. And Jesus is focusing on our sin. And he says, I need to get you right first, spiritually, before you can be made right physically for some people. And for some people, it is just a spiritual, and you go on in life realizing that my sins have been forgiven and I'm set free and I get to move on. I am no longer paralyzed by what got me here. I am now set free, and God is not holding it over my head anymore. I am released. I go on my way. Understand, we hold sin over people's heads. Jesus forgives it. I don't know what it was that he did. We didn't hear it, and nor do we need to know. But sin paralyzes. In this particular case, it was physical, but sin paralyzes. And it causes immobility. It causes us to be hindered and boxed in. And it causes us to be put in a place where we need our friends to help us and godly friends around are a great thing to have because these are people that bring us to the point and to the place where we need to be because they bring us to Jesus. People, when you are interceding for your friends, don't stop. To, to, to what end will you go to make sure that your friends get introduced to Jesus Christ? Are you an insider in the house learning from Jesus or, or are you an outsider in the way of people getting to see Jesus? Are you preventing people from getting to know him by the way you live? Or are you inviting them in by the choices you make with your life? I'm going to continue the rest of this next week because we're out of town, and I'm going to spend some time on the call of Matthew, and we're going to do that. We're not going to do that this week because there's some things I want to notice with that because understand now, Jesus just demonstrated he has the power to forgive sins, and then he's going to go and he's going to now deal with, he's going to now deal with one of the ugliest of sinners in the Jewish nation, the tax collector. He has the authority to forgive sins, but the guy that he's going to next forgive, no one wants forgiven. And so this one, everyone wanted this guy helped. Come on, he's a poor paralyzed dude. And his friends brought him. And Jesus heals him. But here's what I like what he says. Jesus saw their faith, and then he forgives sin, equating himself or equaling himself with God because he is. And this morning for you and I, my question is for you. Are you learning from Jesus inside because you want to be a follower of his? Or, or are you on the outside just wanting to see what he's going to do next? Yeah, I hear his teaching, but man, this Jesus is spectacular. You know, those Christian folk, boy, I mean, they just kind of got to go. God is doing some great things over there. Are you letting him do something to you personally? And then my second question is, are you in the way of people coming to see Jesus, the crowd, or are you bringing people to Jesus, his four friends? Are you in the way, or are you bringing people to him? That is our question for us today. Yes, there's an obstacle, but true faith climbs over that obstacle. And when you respond in true faith to trust in Jesus Christ, he says, it takes notice. Yes, your situation may be dire, it may be hurtful, it may seem impossible, but true faith does something. And then Jesus responds to true faith. He forgives the sins, and he heals. And our response to him today is, do we see that he has authority to forgive and to heal? Are we responding that way? Are we living that way? Or are we just saying it, but we really don't believe it?
God leaves that choice to you and I. 